get started with looking at adding whole numbers. Now the process of adding is a process of finding how many you have all together, finding totals. And if we have, for example, two things and three things, one thing we can do is put them in one-to-one -one correspondence with our fingers and then count on our fingers. Or we can write this out as the mathematical form 2 plus 3 is equal to 5. Now, let's look at some of the terms associated with addition. The things you add together are called add-ins. And the, what you get, the total, is often referred to as the sum. And you'll see this word used a lot in everyday life. So it's good to remember that at the very least, when you see the word sum, it means the total result of adding everything up, or just the total. Anyway, let's look at some of the properties of addition. This shows one. If I have two things and three things, I'll have five. It's the same as having three things and two things. So the way we would write this is two plus three is exactly the same as three plus two, and in both cases, we get five. This is known as the commutative property of addition. And really, what that two-bit word says is that the order of operations doesn't matter. 2 plus 3 is the same as 3 plus 2, or to express it in the most general way, a plus b is equal to b plus a, where a and b are any two numbers. Now, one of the things that is going to help you a lot is if you take the addition table like this. For example, you can look over horizontally and down vertically. So if I go two horizontally, four down vertically, I see it's six. Two plus four is six. It would be very wise for you to memorize the addition table. And the way I would recommend you do it is make flashcards with the answer on the back and the answer disappears. Now the way that I use flashcards, and I've used them successfully to learn not only math facts, but physics equations, and in particular Spanish, is to have your pile of cards with the question on the front, the answer on the back, so the answer is upright when you flip the card over, you go through the pile of cards. If you get it right, you put it over here. If you get it wrong, you put it here. Then you pick up the wrong pile, go through those and then ultimately you will be working with a smaller and smaller pile until you know it all. Then just to be sure, get the original pile shuffle and go through it again. And typically after you've done this a few times, you'll know the stuff. Flashcards really work. Now let's look at adding larger columns of numbers. What about 123 plus 45? Well, kind of big to do on your fingers. So let's look at how we would do this. First, we would put these things in line, adding up the ones column, the tens column, and the hundreds column. And there is a zero implied if one of those numbers doesn't have as many digits as the other. For example, there is no hundreds in 45. Then we add the ones, we add the tens, and there's a zero implied in front of the 45, so we add the hundreds. We can do the same thing in the reverse order. Add the ones, add the tens, add the hundreds. Know that there's an implied zero. Five and three are eight. Four and two are six. And one and zero is one. So we have exactly the same thing. Let's look at a couple more examples. 408 plus 561. So we Line them up, we add them up. So there they are lined up, and 8 and 1 are 9, 0 and 6 are 6, 4 and 5 are 9. Let's look at another example. How about 357 plus 121? Okay. We line them up, then we add them up. So here we go, 1 and 7 is 8, 5 and 2 is 7, 3 and 1 are 4. How about something a little more complicated, like this one? But it's the same process. You line them up and add them up, column by column. So 
no matter how complex something looks, it's going to work the same way. Now, what about adding more than two numbers together? How would we do that? For example, suppose we had 3 plus 5 plus 6. Well, one way would be to group the 3 plus 5 to get 8 and then add 6 to it. And if we did that, we would get 14. But what about if we added the 3 to the 5 plus 6 grouping? Well, that gives us 3 plus 11 is 14. And amazingly enough, we get exactly the same answer. Now, this is actually one of the properties of addition called the associative property. And really what it says is that the order of grouping doesn't matter. And to put it in the more abstract terms, we have A plus B grouped together plus C. That's exactly the same as A plus the grouping B plus C, where A, B, and C are any numbers. And again, our example showed that. So what we can say is that it really doesn't matter how numbers are grouped together. Let's look at an example of that. Let's add this column up. So I take the first two numbers, 2 plus 5, get 7. Then take the 1, add the 7 and 1 to get 8. Then I take the 8 to get 16, which is the answer or the sum of the numbers in that column. Let's look at something a tiny bit more complicated. How about where we have a couple of columns, 22 plus 15 plus 31 plus 11? Well, we, we do it exactly the same way. We take the 2 plus 5 and get 7. 7 plus 1 is 8. 8 plus 1 is 9. We're done adding that column up, so the 9 goes under there. Then we work on the tens column. 2 plus 1 is 3, plus 3 is 6 plus 1 is 7, and the 7 goes at the bottom of the tens column, so our total or our sum is 79. But what happens now if that number at the bottom of the units column were bigger than 9, suppose it were 11 or 14? What happens then? Well, let's look at this little video, and it'll help point us in the right direction. Can I help you, madam? Yes. They told me I have to pay for my courses here, and they gave me this. Well, let's see. It says there that you owe $158 for your Math 86 class and $169 for your Ultimate Frisbee class. OK, I'll pay you in cash. Here it is. Just a minute. OK, here you go. 1, 100, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's for the math course. Then 100, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's for my Frisbee course. I'm sorry, madam. I can't take this. What? What do you mean you can't take that? Don't you use cash anymore? There's 11 tens and 17 ones right here. You can't say 200, 11, and 17. And if I can't say it, I can't take it. Look, dummy, give me a $10 bill and I'll show you how to fix this. Here. OK, I'm going to take this 10, put it here, and give you 10 back from here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. OK, now we're even. Gee, where'd you learn to do this? Duh! Maybe you should be taking Math 86. Do they cover this in Math 86? Well, I'd like to thank my sister for helping me out with that. Anyway, let's take a close look at what went on there. Um, you notice that in this slide, I'm trying to add 17 and 8. So let's split that up into 110 plus 7 ones and add 8 ones to it. So I have 110 and 15 ones. Again, hard to write as a regular number. But suppose I split that 15 up this way. Um, the 15 can be 110 and 5 ones. Then I can add the two tens together, and so I get 210 and 5 ones which is equal to 25, which I can say is the sum of that number. 
Let's look at another example. So I have 46 plus 78. So again, I add the units, the ones column, and I get 14. But then I have to somehow get rid of the tens piece of that. So what I do then is take the 4, write that down, but since the 1 is, belong, is a 10 anyway, I put that in the tens column and then add that up from there. So I have 1 plus 4 is 5, plus 7 is 12. And this is actually a process called carrying because what you literally do is carry that 1 in the tens place over and then add that in to get 124. So the process, if you get a number bigger than 9 in any column, you carry whatever is left over or whatever is greater than the unit for that column into the next bigger column. Let's look at another example of this. So um, we're going to take this in pieces and do it a little at a time. First, let's add the units column. So 5 plus 8 plus 2 is 15. Incidentally, here's a little trick I use. This is an aside. I notice 8 plus 2 is 10 right away, plus 5 is 15. So I check when I'm adding things down to see if I can make tens or even numbers, then add the rest to it. Sometimes it's easier to add things not in the order they're in. Anyway, back to the problem. So now I have 15 at that column. So I write a 5 in the units column carry the 1 to the tens column. Then I add that up and get 13, but again, now what I need to do is carry the 1 on the 13 over to the hundreds column and then add that up. 6 and 4 are 10. Notice I can do that right away. 1 and 3 are 4, and I get 14. So sometimes as you practice, you'll find that there are these little shortcuts, if you practice enough, you'll start to see some shortcuts in doing the additions, like grouping by tens, and it just makes it easier. Anyway, now let's look at some word problems that involve addition. So, John went on a trek, and he walked eight miles the first day, 13 the second day, that was a bad second day, and nine miles the third day, and we want to know how far John walks and all. And this is typical of a lot of the word problems you'll be seeing in math. Let's extract the more important information. So John walks 8 miles, 13 miles, and 9 miles, and we want to know how far John travels and all. So I outline that information below, and this same question how far does John travel in all can be asked in several ways, and it's good to recognize the ways you ask about addition. For example, what is the sum? And there is the key, the word sum, that tells you an addition is going to be involved. How far does John travel all together? And what is the total distance? So sum, all together, total are words that tell you that you're dealing with an addition problem. And of course, the next thing we have to do is actually solve the problem. So we do the addition and John travels 30 miles. Incidentally, if you're dealing with problems that deal with physical units, don't just write the number 30 down. It's important the unit is also part of the problem, and so 30 miles is the whole answer. 30 is a part of the answer. Here's another problem. Sally has rabbits in her yard, and she decides to build a fence around her yard, which is 1,573 feet long and 768 feet wide. And we want to know how many feet of fencing she needs in all. So again, let's extract the important part of the information out of here. So there is the what she needs, and there is what we need to figure out. So a good thing to do always is to try to make a diagram that illustrates the information. It always helps me to see it. And so here you see, we see we need to find out the total distance, add all of that up. And again, you add it up column by column. I notice that I have the answer to each of those columns is in the 20s. So in each case, I have to carry it to. 
and the total distance around, called the perimeter, we'll talk about that more later, is 4,682. Again, the answer is incomplete until I stick in feet. Okay, now let's talk about rounding and estimating. That last problem was annoying because that math, I couldn't do it in my head. If I walked into a store and tried to figure out how to do it on the fly, it would be difficult. So what I'd like to do is find a way to make doing some of this math in my head just a little simpler. So we could estimate, and so uh, we could say about how many feet of fencing does she need in all. And so the process of estimation is the process of approximating an answer and then um, using rounded numbers to do the math, which will let you approximate the answer. So here's the process. We round the numbers to some appropriate place, and it really depends on how closely and accurately you want or how much of the math you want to do in your head. And then after we've rounded the numbers, then we go back and do the math. So here is our original problem where we get 4,682 feet, but that's hard to do in your head. Let's round all of those distances to the nearest hundred. Now, isn't that easier to add? There we get 4,800 feet total, and it's pretty close to the 4,682 we got before, but this let us come to some sort of an idea or an estimate a little bit faster. So this is the process of estimating, which involves rounding, then doing the math. 